I'm going to collapse this to an edible poly. If you don't already know what's going to happen, you might be a little surprised. So it's the exact same file, except I'm saving this teapot as an edible poly versus an edible mesh. Save it, and what do you think the file size is now? Before, of course, it was 11.2, and uh, now it just increased a whopping 66% to 18.6 megabytes. A huge increase for absolutely no change in the display. No change in the rendering, no change in anything that would affect the rendered output other than the fact that it's a much larger file size and could take a lot longer to render if RAM became an issue. It will consume more RAM and it will be harder to render if you run out of RAM and information is uh, having to be pushed back and forth unnecessarily between the hard drive and the RAM. Short of that, it won't affect the render time at all since it has the same number of polygons, um, or does it? Notice the polygon counter says now it has 131,000 polygons. Do you remember how just a moment ago it was saying 262,000 polygons with this same teapot? As I mentioned before, the polygon counter doesn't always tell the truth, like now. When I had this object as an editable mesh, it really wasn't 262,000 polygons that it was displaying. It was displaying 262,000 faces. Big difference. Right now, it's correct. It says 131,000 polygons, and that's exactly what the object has. So each polygon is made up of two faces. So the point I'm trying to make is, if you're finished working on an object and you want to collapse it, always collapse your objects as edible mesh. Compared to the edible poly, you reduce the file size and the RAM consumption. I want to illustrate this again by attaching more. I want to go to the attach command, click on more attachments. I want to attach as many as I can without crashing max. I want to take, take it all the way to 12 gigabytes. Now it's time to stop attaching. I want to go to this teapot, adjust this teapot to purge the RAM list, the RAM structure. Um, now I'm even less. I'm down to 6.3 gigabytes. Hopefully you see what I'm getting at. Uh, I'm creating a more efficient scene by having uh, more objects attached together. There are a certain number of processes and steps that have to be handled behind the scenes that you don't even know about. A certain number of steps that have to run whenever you're doing anything in Max. Uh, whether you're refreshing viewports, whether you're turning on and off objects, whether you're rendering, whether you're opening up uh, material editor, everything that you do in Max requires a lot of steps. An enormous number of steps running behind the scenes that you won't even know about and you can't even keep track of or, or observe. But you get these little indications that they're occurring by doing what I'm doing here, which is attaching objects together and watching how the memory is consumed. So going through this process of attaching uh, objects together while painstakingly slow in some cases is going to save me a lot of time and a lot of grief in the long run by saving RAM. And it looks like looks like I came close to crashing max there, so I have to be careful when I'm doing this not to crash. So this is painstakingly slow, but it is absolutely critical to having good, efficient scenes. Now look at the RAM usage. I'm down to 4.5 gigabytes. So I'm going to stop it right there. But if I continued on, I, I, if I continued on, I think I could probably get this down to around 2 gigabytes. And that's huge. That's a huge difference between 2 gigabytes and 9 gigabytes, or 9.5 gigabytes that I had before when I had all these rows as separate objects. So my, my point in showing you all this is you've got to know, looking at a scene, is it time to attach objects? Is it time to leave them separated? Is it time to collapse them or leave the modifier stack as is? This image shows three different render status windows that appear after the render process is initiated. I should mention that I use V-Ray, so if you use something else, you're likely to see something else. But regardless, the BSP is generated before any GI is calculated or any pixels are rendered. In very small scenes, this process could happen so fast you're likely to not even see these windows. So how is the BSP tree created? The name itself, Binary Space Partition Tree, provides a clue as to what it is and how the structure is created. In 2D graphics, the BSP tree starts with an area of space. In 3D graphics, it starts with a volume space. That space is divided or partitioned into two or binary parts. Uh, 
Uh, specifically, when you initiate a rendering, a bounding box is placed around your scene, your entire scene, and this box represents the root of the tree and the initial space to be partitioned. All of the faces in a scene are divided into two nodes or spaces. Then each of these two nodes are divided into two nodes and each in uh, each of these nodes are divided into two nodes and so on. The process repeats itself over and over until one of two things happens. Until the maximum allowable number of node divisions or levels is reached or until the maximum number of faces allowed to be stored in any node is reached. The final branch i.e. space or node of the tree is referred to as a leaf. Every face of every scene is stored in a leaf somewhere at the end of some branch of the BSP tree. So why break down the scene in this way? Well, when a ray is traced through the tree of information, it is very easy for the engine to determine if the ray intersects any given node. If a ray doesn't intersect a node, then the faces stored within that node don't need to be tested, which of course saves valuable time. If a ray does intersect a node, then the engine tests all the smaller spaces that make up that space until it finds a space that contains the individual faces. The engine then intersects the ray with each of the faces in the space. This image is the file I'm loading, and it's taken a moment because it's an extremely large file, 582 megabytes to be exact. So the first thing I noticed when I when I opened this compared to the image that, that we just saw a moment ago is there are no background objects. There, the mountains aren't there. The lake is not there. And part of that, the reason for part of that is uh, a lot of the objects are turned off. Uh, I will turn off uh, some of the objects in just a moment. There are an enormous number of objects that are turned off. And that's to facilitate uh, setting up cameras, moving around the scene properly. As it is, the scene has uh, got a lot to it. First thing I want to do when I when I observe a scene and go into a scene is check out the file properties. So if I go to the far left menu and click on properties down at the bottom, I can go to file properties and then contents to get a general overall picture of what's going on in the scene. First thing I want to focus on is faces. There are 12,281,000 faces, a little bit fewer number of vertices. So it's a big scene, 12 million faces, that's, that's a big scene. Notice it doesn't say anything about polygons because that really doesn't matter when it comes to rendering or file size. Next thing I notice, jumps, it jumps out at me tremendously, is the number of objects, 18,230 objects. I know the scene pretty well, and, and I'll just tell you straight up that the, the guys at Catapult, they obviously built a beautiful scene, a great scene, and they aren't as concerned about scene optimization as uh, many of us uh, probably are or should be. So they don't, as they, again, they don't follow some of the procedures that I'm talking about. And one of those that's, that would really, really make it difficult to work in the scene or to get around the scene is the number of objects. They have an enormous number of objects. If I was building the scene, if I was cleaning this up, or if, if I had built the scene the way I would build it, I can assure you there would probably be no more than a couple hundred objects in the scene, and it would be much easier to to work in the scene you know if I got my hands on it and it would consume a lot less resources nonetheless eighteen thousand objects that's way too much lights that's an okay number of lights perhaps for a daytime scene that's it might be a little too much and I can tell you that this scene is is not this rendering that you just saw it's not just a single rendering it's act, they actually have an animation if you go to their website. Uh, the website that they have, you would actually see an animation of this, and it's quite beautiful, and they had some nighttime shots. So some of these lights are turned off, and, and that's fine. So that that's fine. I just take a quick little peek at the dependency files that they have, and they obviously have a lot of, a lot of maps, a lot of dependency files that they need for the scene. I just want to observe a few things about this and, and point them out as a little unusual. First thing I want to look at, notice takes about 15 to 20 seconds to open this scene. Why? Because each one of these objects have modifiers that must be rebuilt when the scene opens. All three teapots start off with 64 segments, giving each of them 262,000 faces. And each of them have a normal modifier, a cap holes modifier applied. But the first one has the pro-optimized modifier. The second one has the regular old-fashioned optimized modifier. And the third has the multi-res modifier. Which one is better? I'll let you decide. If you look at the polygon counter, notice that 
Teapot 001 has 7,800 faces, faces, not polygons. Uh, the second one has 7,800 faces, and the third has 7,800 faces. I made all three of these have the same number of faces, yet clearly, both in the viewport and during the rendering, you'll see significant improvements in the pro-optimized version than you would in the other two. The pro-optimized version has some advanced algorithms that somehow are able to create this teapot using the same number of faces, but create those faces or organize those faces in a way that creates a smoother look with less facets and less artifacts. Uh, but I see somebody's asked a question that's been sitting here for a little while, so I'll address it briefly before moving on. Somebody has asked, is there a way to increase RAM's priority for Mac's sake? Is there a way to increase RAM's priority for Mac's sake? Sort of. You can assign priority to a process so that your computer places priority on a certain program first and devotes your computer resources, including RAM, to that program before anything else. If you open up Task Manager and go to Processes, you'll see all the different processes that are being used right now. And by the way, these are just the processes that I, as, as a user, am using. Notice that the username is Brian Smith, that's me. Um, if I click on Show Processes from All Users, it shows not only the ones that I'm using, not only the programs that I'm using, but all the processes that Windows is running behind the scenes. So it's a lot of memory consumption for things that aren't even related to 3ds Max. If you select any program or any process in this list, right click and set priority to something higher like uh, above normal or high, that will make Max the high. Not only that, since this image isn't being used during the, the rendering process, since it's used just to model the sand before the rendering even took place, if you leave it sitting in the material editor, it's going to get loaded into RAM anyway. It's still going to get loaded into RAM because all the maps in the material editor get loaded into RAM when you open a scene. So you also need to make sure you don't keep large unused maps in your material editor. Uh, let's look at what else we have here. This looks like another displacement map here, another black and white image. Notice how blurry this image is. This image is very blurry, and I don't know what this was used for, but this is an example of a map that's way oversized because anything this blurry is not going to have any detail anyway, right? So uh, what's the point of having such a large map size if you're not requiring that detail to be built in? Anyway, all these maps are way too big for my taste, and I would scale them down before ever using them. So if I was asked to analyze the scene to try to figure out how to optimize it, one of the first things I would look at would be the maps, because that's one thing that people seem to let go way too often, and I would try to fix that first. And I'm going to show you a really quick, easy way to fix it. It takes less than a minute to adjust all these maps. If I select the maps that I want to change, and I want to...